Good morning to everyone who is physically here, trying to get through security, uh, watching on live streaming or on C-SPAN. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center and a recovering politician, having served <laughs> nine terms in the United States Congress. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a very important uh, national conversation on Congress, the presidency, and military intervention. Uh, last week, I was at Harvard Law School, an institution I attended decades back, uh, and I was uh, teaching a seminar on authorization for war. It was a three-hour seminar, and of course, I didn't think I was skilled enough to do this all by myself. So Skyped in was a man sitting in the front row, uh, Jeff Smith, who is a uh, partner in charge of the national security practice at a major law firm, was the former general counsel of the CIA, and was counsel to the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, under Senator Sam Nunn, and knows a boatload about this subject, uh, as do the members of this panel. Uh, Jeff, again, my thanks for making me look good, uh, and I hope the rest of you do the same. Uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says, quote, Congress shall have the power to declare war, unquote. But up to this point, this Congress has been AWOL. Uh, we're at war, that's the administration's term, with ISIL, a new enemy. But the administration is relying on decade-old decade authorities. <coughs> Though the president has decided to seek a new authorization to use military force, AUMF, his administration insists that the old authorizations apply too. Well, I voted for them. I voted for the 2001 AUMF, and I voted for the very controversial 2002 Iraq AUMF. This isn't the fight those of us who voted for those AUMFs intended to authorize. This is a fight against a new enemy in a new country. More than a year ago, right here at the Wilson Center, Center Senator Bob Corker, uh, who will become, I think, the new chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, warned that Congress had no ownership whatsoever of our foreign policy. He was right then, and he's right today, and we aren't the only people saying this. Half a dozen new AUMFs have been introduced by both parties in both houses, including by our keynote speaker today, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia. Very astute observers, like Jack Goldsmith and Matt Waxman have flagged just how unprecedented uh, President Obama's approach is. In an article in the New Republic about a month ago, they call this president, not President Bush 43, quote, the master of unilateral war, unquote. I'm sure Jack will speak to that today. With the midterm elections and three months of airstrikes behind us, I think it's past time to address this issue. The president has realize that welcoming Congress to act isn't asking Congress to act. And just last week, he requested new, tailored authorization from Congress. But if the president was right to ask, and he surely was right, then Congress also needs to do. The duck and blame game has to end. It's time to govern, and in my view, that governing and that process ought to begin now in the lame duck session. The pending bills raise important issues, and I'm sure we'll discuss them. Should the old AUMFs be repealed? What should the new scope of any new authority be? And how will we pay for operations that have already cost nearly $1 billion? We'll move that dialogue forward mm -hmm. today, but the American people deserve representation in this debate. They ought to get it now through Congress. With that, I'd like to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia. Since he was elected to represent Virginia uh, just a few years ago, Senator Kaine has made his mark on the Committee on Armed Services, Foreign Relations Committee, and in the War Powers debate. He's worked across party lines with Senator John McCain to bring the 1973 War Powers Resolution up to date. And this September, he introduced, and he's been advocating for, his proposal for a new AUMF against ISIL. After his remarks, which will be approximately 10 minutes, Senator Kane will join me uh, and Jack Goldsmith, who will be introduced shortly, uh, in a conversation with Jim Shudo, 
the chief national security correspondent for CNN, and I think the only journalist to embed uh, in 2003 in the Iraq invasion. Do I have that right? With U.S. Special Forces. With right? U.S. Yeah. Special Forces. Yo. Okay. <laughs> uh, former <laughs> chief correspondent for a ABC in London and author of a book entitled Against, Against Us, The New Face of America's Enemies in the Muslim World. We're happy to have them all with us today and on the first day of the lame duck session, I hate that name, <laughs> Uh, on the first day of Congress coming back into session, uh, uh, it is the right time not only to have this discussion, uh, but to call for action in Congress. Thank you very much. Okay, Jay, thank you. Thank you and good morning. Um, if past history is any guide, I'm hoping that a lame session will be followed by a virile duck. Uh, so that, that is my hope for the next uh, two months. I want to thank Jane for the introduction and the opportunity to be here with uh, Jim and Jack to talk about an issue that I'm very passionate about. Hard to say everything I want to say in ten minutes, but let me try to just say three things. First, and I never do this, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this matters to me so much. It's not relevant to whether what I propose is, is good or bad, but I went to the wreath laying ceremony at Iwo Jima Memorial Monday and it was at Veterans Day events yesterday. and that maybe want to talk for a minute about why this matters to me personally. Second, I want to talk about uh, what's at stake, both the constitutional allocation of powers between a president and Congress, but also an underlying moral value that to me seems to be the real issue that we often don't talk about. And third, I want to talk about what we need to do, and I have a, an immediate term, a short term, and a long term. Hmm. Why does it matter to me? Um, people come into uh, elected office with passions and interests, and I have many. But I only have one obsession, and this is it. Uh, my obsession with how the nation makes a decision to go to war and what are the right processes that would engage Congress, the President, and the American public, it is an obsession of mine, and I'm going to be focused on this as long as I'm blessed to be here. The obsession started when I was Lieutenant Governor of Virginia and watched the debate around the Iraq authorization in October of 2002. Um, I was a lieutenant governor. I didn't know anything about the intel, and I assumed everything I heard was true. But even assuming it was all true, and some of it turned out later not to be true, I was very troubled with the fact that a vote was being pushed right before a midterm with no apparent reason for the timing. Remember, we didn't go into Iraq until March of 2003. So what explained having a big debate and vote, I was listening to it on NPR, and doing it in October of 2002? I concluded that, that the most likely explanation was a desire to hopefully make a midterm election work out better. And let's push the timing so that it happened. And it turned out to be very smart politics in the sense that the midterm election mm -hmm. did work out better than it might otherwise have worked out. But I think it turned out to be very, very problematic. And I would put that vote, and look, I've cast votes that I'd take back, but I put that vote up with maybe the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 as, as a low moment for Congress. That started my obsession. I became governor. One of the jobs of governor is to be commander-in-chief of the Guard, the Virginia Guard and Air Guard. Now, that's a part of the governor's job that nobody talks about. You don't campaign about it. It doesn't go on the bumper sticker. But when you're in two wars and you have thousands of people being deployed multiple times uh, in many cases, as a governor, you go to the funerals, you go to the deployments, you go to the homecomings. I visited Iraq and Afghanistan to see our troops there. One of my cabinet secretary's sons was badly injured by an IED. One of my church members I sing in the choir with had a son that was killed in Iraq. Another of my cabinet secretary's sons was not physically injured but came back suffering some significant challenges as a result of his service. Along the way I have both a son and nephew who've joined the military. This is up close and personal to us in Virginia. It's very up close and personal. So my, my thought about the policy and the fact that it's so present to us in Virginia and even in my own family has turned this into a real obsession of mine, and it's an important issue. What's at stake here? First thing's at stake, and we have one of the real experts on this, and Jack on this panel, is the constitutional allocation of powers. How should we make a decision to go to war? And the framers had such a clear view of this, um, and it was, a, it was smart. And they were Virginians, so forgive me for like maybe you know, leaning a little bit heavy into them, but, um, and it is important when you look at the Constitution, and Jane read the section from, from Article One about Congress's power to declare war. We're used to our Constitution. We forget how abnormal it is, how unusual it is. 
war prior to our Constitution was for the king. It was for the executive. That was what the world history had been. So the framers of the Constitution stood in the flow of history and tried to alter it a different direction and put the decision-making powers about war into a legislative branch, taking it away from a monarchy, taking it away from an executive. It's Congress that declares war. It's the president who's the commander-in-chief once a war is declared because the last thing you need is 535 commanders-in-chief. But in describing why it was done this way, these folks were very clear. George Mason of Virginia, during the debate about ratification, said, this provision is meant to be a facilitator of peace, not a facilitator of war. It's meant to be a clogger of war by handing the power to Congress. Principal drafter James Madison, about 10 years after the Constitution was final, wrote a letter to Jefferson and said, our Constitution supposes what the history of all governments demonstrates, that it is the executive that is the branch most interested in war and most prone to it. It is for this reason that we have put the question of war in the legislative branch. And another Virginian, one of our first presidents, Thomas Jefferson, was confronted with a, a war kind of similar to what we're dealing with now, a quasi-terrorist organization in, in the Mediterranean, North Africa, the Barbary Pirates, grappled with what Congress had said, what the Constitution said about the allocation powers. Jefferson knew, as president and commander-in-chief, I can always defend the nation immediately. So as our ships were being attacked, he could tell the commanders of the ships, you've got to defend yourselves. He didn't need Congress for that. But at some point, he decided, you know what, just defending every new ship attack doesn't seem too smart. Can't we go on offense against the Barbary pirates? And he said, when I go beyond the line of defense, I can't do that without the sanction of Congress. So it was very clear initially from the beginning that a president could defend against them in an attack without Congress, although you should get Congress on board later. Congress, though, had to declare war. Any going on offense against anyone other than imminent defense took a congressional declaration. That was the, the clear understanding, but we've gotten it wrong virtually since the ink was dry, and it doesn't matter whether presidents or congresses are Republican or Democrat or Whig or Federalist. We've gotten it wrong, and we've gotten it wrong because Madison was half right, but he wasn't cynical enough. Madison described the provision of the war powers provisions as a check against executive power. It's the executive branch most prone to war, most interested in it, therefore we put it in the legislative branch. He saw monarchs and executives overreach, but what he didn't see is legislatures abdicate. War is unpopular. People will get killed. My constituents may not like it. Well, maybe if the president can initiate, and then if it works out well, we can say, boy, Mr. President, you know, we were with you all the time. And if it works out poorly, Mr. President, I mean, how dare you? I can't believe you did this without coming to Congress. From the beginning, there has been a tendency toward congressional abdication, and I would argue, if anything, it is that that is more explanatory of our current dilemma than executive overreach. But in, in any event, there is a symbiotic pathology between executive overreach and congressional abdication that has put us in a situation where presidents like President Obama, you can go all the way back, are more prone to start things unilaterally without Congress. So one value is we ought to get the constitutional, we ought to get our decision making back so that it respects the allocation of powers. That was, that was a revolutionary thing when it was done and that actually still is. That war shouldn't be for the monarch or the executive, it should be for the legislative. The second thing at stake is the underlying value and this is what really matters to me. If we don't do it the way the framers intended, if we allow war to be done in a, uh, unilaterally by a president with a Congress that stands back and says, ah, we don't re really want to get involved, there's a midterm coming up, man, P we might make people mad, then we ask people to risk their lives. I mean, we're asking people to risk their lives every day. We've had the first combat death already against ISIL, um, a corporal, Marine corporal from Indiana who was killed in an incident with an Osprey helicopter supporting the airstrike campaign on the 2nd of October, Jordan Spears was his name. We're asking people to risk their lives, or risk injury, or risk capture, or risk the mental stress of seeing these things happen to their colleagues, or the mental stress of seeing that these things might happen to civilians who are an unfortunate but always a necess you know, al always kind of a part of the, the damage in war. How dare we ask people to risk that if we're not willing to do our job to have a debate in front of the American public and then put our thumbprint on the mission and say this is in the national interest? What we're afraid of having that debate, we don't want to say it's in the national interest, but still go risk your life. 
That seems to me to be the height of public immorality. What could you do? Bribery is bad. A whole lot of things are bad. What could you do that would be more publicly immoral than ordering people to risk their lives without like having a discussion about whether the mission is worth it or not? That's what's really at stake. And when you don't have Congress have the debate, you not only violate the Constitution, but you force people to risk their lives without a consensus that the mission is in the national interest. Finally, what should we do? Very quickly, I've proposed three things. First, we have to have a legal authorization to cover this current military mission against ISIL because in my view, from about mid-August to now, there has not been legal authority that is sufficient to authorize this mission. When the President started airstrikes on August 8th, there was a credible claim that ISIL's momentum could potentially jeopardize United States Embassy personnel, either in Baghdad or more likely in Erbil, in Iraq. So he was defending the United States as presidents can do without coming to Congress. But by about mid-August, we were engaged in airstrikes to retake a dam that posed no threat to Erbil or, or Baghdad, that posed no threat to the United States. We were helping rescue refugees, an important thing, but there was no imminent threat to American interest. And so from that time, we have been engaged. As the President said, we've gone on offense against ISIL. As Chuck Hagel said, we're in a war against ISIL. We have been engaged in a war that is not about imminent defense of the United States without legal authority. The President's Article II powers as Commander-in-Chief are, as Jefferson said, about defending against imminent threat. We're beyond that. And I frankly view the argument that either the 01 or 02 authorizations covers this offensive mission against ISIL as ridiculous. Mm -hmm. This mission against ISIL is not covered by the wording of those authorizations. It's not covered by the intent of those authorizations. It's not covered by what members of Congress thought when they voted for these authorizations. And maybe most importantly, it's not covered by what President Obama has said about the authorizations. In May of 2013, he said the 2001 AUMF authorization should be narrowed and repealed, not expanded. And he sent witnesses to testify before us in the Senate about the 2002 Iraq authorization and said it was obsolete and it was time to repeal it. So in my view, there is currently no legal authority to support the action against ISIL unless and until Congress comes in, has the debate and votes. That's why I've introduced a resolution. In the short term, we should deal with it right away. Second. We do need to deal with the 2001 authorization because that, that continues to be out there. We could deal with it together with the anti-ISIL authorization or separately, but Congress in 01 passed a brief authorization without a temporal limitation, without a geographic limitation, and because of the definition of associated forces that has been kind of glommed into the 01 authorization, even the targets that were subject to that authorization are now very broad, multiple theaters of war. We're still at war under that authorization 13 years later, and administration officials have said that they think the war authorized by the 2001 authorization will likely go on for another 25 or 30 years. That is unacceptable, and we should be having a debate to significantly narrow that authorization, especially since members of Congress, like Congresswoman Harmon, in 2001 explicitly rejected the Bush administration's attempt to have a broader authorization. The Bush administration came to Congress and said, give us the authorization to take essentially preemptive action against terrorist groups before they hurt us, and Congress overwhelmingly rejected that. Mm -hmm. But what both administrations have done basically is expand the authorization that was passed to basically be what Congress rejected in 01. The last thing I think we should do, and I have introduced legislation with Senator McCain to do this, is go back into the War Powers Resolution in 1973 and come up with a better process for this discussion that will take place, always will take place between Congress and the President, a process that respects both sides' constitutional prerogatives. There's a, a group at the University of Virginia, the Miller Center, that has studied this under, the, under a panel that was led by Jim Baker and Warren Christopher, and they concluded, actually, there's never really been a golden era in America where we've gotten this right. We changed the process here, there, and everywhere. I'm under no illusion that a better process will make these decisions easy, far from it. But not having a process takes hard and consequential decisions and makes them even harder. And so Senator McCain and I have a bill to <coughs> call the War Powers Consultation Act of uh, 2014 that tries to take the dialogue process, define what in fact is a war in the 21st century that would trigger consultation and voting, cyber attacks, drones, non-state actors, what is a war, 
Second, defines what consultation is so that a president can't say, I consulted with Congress when he just calls one person. Mm -hmm. And third, defines what voting requirements would be and that, so that Congress would have to be on the board and do their job. These are the three things we're working on. We do need, as, as Jane said, to do this right now in the lame duck. There's no reason to extend this questionable war for five or six months before Congress gets around to it. I'm excited that we have our first meeting about it in the Foreign Relations uh, Committee today, and I look forward to working with my colleagues in the debate today. Thank you. Great. Okay. Perfect. Well, listen, it's an honor to be on the stage today next to Senator Kane, who's been at the forefront of an issue that I cover every day. Uh, Jack Goldsmith, professor, Harvard Law School, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, which means he has two decent educational institutions covered. <laughs> and, uh, and Jane, it's always great to see Jane. We see each other in the, in the CNN green room, but often in the field as well. Uh, we're in Ukraine together for elections, right. and you know, we'll always have the Maidan, oh, my right? Maidan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Senator Kane, I wonder if I could begin with you. you this is an issue that, that splits both parties. Um, and you, you, you see the president now oddly you know, presenting this, th that he wants to pursue a new AUMF, possibly as an olive branch to the other side, but also knowing that, that there's some in the GOP that might give, you know, be more forward-leaning than members of his own party. I wonder if in the current environment we can look at this issue as one where there's a potential for bipartisan agreement um, to, to give some definition whether before or, or ideally, as you, as, you, as you say, during the lame duck session, but perhaps after as well. Um, I do. I actually, yeah. I look at the split in both parties not as a, a negative, but as a positive. So many things up on the Hill now get divided into the partisan camps. This clearly is, is not partisan. On Foreign Relations Committee, one of my hardest votes thus far was the vote about whether to authorize use of military force in Syria to punish Bashar al-Assad for use of chemical weapons against civilians. The vote was a 10-8 vote, but it was a nonpartisan vote. It was a divided vote because the question was hard. But it was a nonpartisan vote because it didn't break down along partisan lines. Um, there are Republicans who do not like the notion of executive power exercised muscularly by this president or other presidents who I think would resonate with this. Um, and there are Democrats of, vari of a variety of the big tent that we have in the Democratic Party who I think uh, feel, well, they have, may have different feelings about the ISIL mission itself and the parameters of it. They do feel strongly that they don't want to cede that power purely to an executive. So I do think that this is a, and, and Senator Corker, who I work closely with, mm -hmm. um, I know this has been a passion of his as well. So I don't see it as a partisan issue, and I think that that creates some opportunity for finding a path forward. Now, there are some specifics that are important specifics where there are, are some partisan differences. You want to have you want to authorize ground troops or do you want to prohibit ground troops? There's some, you know, what should the length of a sunset provision be? There's some tough Mm -hmm. details that are really important where there's going to be some differences. But overall, Dems and ours in Congress, there are plenty who worry about presidential unilateral power. Mm -hmm. Professor Goldsmith, Goldsmith uh, by my count, there have been 3,200 strike missions uh, over Iraq and Syria so far, about 800 have dropped bombs. You, you now have the president authorizing with this latest 1,500 up to 2,900 troops. Uh, th that sounds like a war to me. Uh, isn't this debate arguably too late, um, and, and, and by doing this now, is this, is this mostly about the president's legacy? Uh, does it then set a precedent for other presidents? You know, weigh in on how important it is to, to act even though the war is already underway, and, and if, you know, if, you, if you get through the lame duck session, you, know, you get into the new year, we're talking six, 12 months before you have right. an actual vote on this. Right. So first of all, thank you for inviting me here today. It's a real honor to be on this panel. Um, I don't think it's too late. Obviously, it's not too late. It can happen. And um, it would be very important for the president to go to Congress and for Congress to give him the authorization not just to use force against the Islamic State, but also, as Senator Kane said, to update the 2001 authorization and to give that contemporary approval and legitimacy and to figure out some of the complicated issues that have arisen in, in the last 12 years. But, but do, the, do those necessarily come together, that you get a new authorization, you, you revise the 2001, or is that... Uh, they needn't come together, they can come together, and that's just a matter of how the politics mm -hmm. work right. and what the sequencing is. Um, it might be easier to do it one way or the other. But I think they both should be done, both the ISIL, Islamic State authorization, and updating the 2001 authorization. The president last week basically suggested that they both should be done. Okay. And it would be extraordinarily important to do so for all the reasons Senator Kane said, both legal and political and our constitutional values. 
Um, as for the president's legacy, I do believe that it is very much in his interest to see that this happens. <laughs> for a long time until the rise of the Islamic State, one got the impression that the Obama administration wanted to declare the war against Islamic terrorists over with mm -hmm. by the end of his administration, and so for a long time they resisted going to Congress. The president also has kind of by accident <laughs> developed the most extraordinarily aggressive war powers legacy. He's used force in humanitarian contexts that have never been done before. He's um, done things that have really gutted the central provisions of the war powers resolution. He expanded the 2001 AUMF when he said he wanted to contract it. All of those things will be on his record and all of it can be cleaned up, so to speak, for his legacy if uh, we can work out these issues. In Retroactively, the in effect. He, he will leave on a high note for him okay. <laughs> on these issues. Jane, you know Washington, to say the least, handicapped this for us. As Senator Kane has laid out a, a very uh, ambitious agenda when, when you speak about the AMF revising 2001, but also the possibility of, of the step, the next step, uh, of giving some clarity to the War Powers Act. Um, but, but just for a moment, handicap the chances in this Congress uh, with, with a hard-fought 2016 presidential election coming up, et cetera, that, that you can get real progress on this issue, resolution on this issue. Well, I, I think uh, this was an ugly election. I, no one has missed that. Uh, control changed hands in the Senate, but it didn't change hands because people decided the other team was great and right. uh, the Democratic team was bad. They decided everybody was bad, and Congress does nothing. And I think this was, in many ways, a referendum on the incumbents in Congress. Now we have a, a somewhat new Congress and a new team in control, but I think uh, this Congress is on trial. And the terrorists mm -hmm. aren't gonna check our party registrations before they blow us up. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of get that. They're not gonna interview all of you and figure out which hat are you wearing. <laughs> I have no idea which hat you're wearing. You're wearing a good government hat, right? That's why you're here. And so, are, so is everybody on this panel. And uh, I hope that every editorial board in the country starts writing about the AWOL Congress, the duck and blame Congress. Uh, I think this has to be item number one. As Tim said, mm -hmm. people are dying there. There hasn't been a public debate. The place the public can debate this is through Congress. We've spent a billion dollars. I, I understand that's chump change uh, these days, but a billion over the next month is gonna be more billions, mm -hmm. and there may be more deaths, and there may be uh, turns and twists here that we can't even imagine. And I just, uh, it's not just, that I, I actually agree with you, um, Tim, that this is immoral, um, but I also think it is colossally dumb and unwise politics for both parties, and they better get at it. So you think they will? They better, but will they? Um, I, I mean, sort of. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it starts now. It, it will depend on how, you know, what, what the public says, too. That's why I'm, you know, country, <laughs> digital campaign, editorials, come on, uh, wake folks up. And this is day one, and here mm -hmm. is Tim Kaine on day, hour one of day one down here doing the right thing, which is calling for action. Senator Kaine, do you, do you see the partners on the other side of the aisle, particularly as we have the leadership change? Uh, you'll have a Corker moving into a leadership role, a McCain, uh, et cetera. Do you see, and, and they have very public views on, on this as well, but do you see with that leadership, because there's also a leadership question, con Congress, can the leadership yep. bring their own party right to the table, frankly, on both sides? Do you think that you have the partners present now in Congress that you can work together and go move forward? I'm still a new guy, so I may be an A, but I, but I do think we do. Um, in fact, you know, a, if the president had really pushed Congress to have this debate and vote before we went into recess, mm -hmm. he would have gotten the authorization. Mm -hmm. What's my evidence for that? Well, I sat around the table at the Foreign Relations uh, Committee when we debated, when we met with Secretary Hagel and Secretary Kerry. The single hardest piece of the mission against ISIL that the President proposed in his speech on Tuesday, September 10, was the arming and training of the Syrian opposition. That was the most controversial within Congress, more so than the airstrike campaign. Congress voted for that piece of it uh, in connection with the continuing resolution. The vote was, was two-thirds, one-third in the House, three-quarters, one-quarter in the Senate. And I watched my colleagues around the Foreign Relations Committee table, 18 of them, and I was kind of counting, okay, based on the discussion, who would likely vote yes on an authorization right now? And it was, it was a better margin than the 10-8. That was as of September 13th or 14th. Now, we'll see come November what folks think. But I think, actually, if the President had pushed the authorization at that time, he would have gotten it. Mm -hmm. 
It's a little more complicated now after the midterms, but but I do see partners there on all three of these, the, the immediate term to the long term. I do see partners on both sides. Good to hear. Can I just so say one thing on both of these points about the, the duck and blame Congress and how the president could have gotten the authorization before the midterms? If you look back at every authorization of force since World War II, every single one, every single major one, they only, and there have been about 10 or 12, the, they only came about because the president insisted on yeah. it. It's very hard for Congress to do this on its own for all of the reasons we've seen. President Obama has gone from saying, I welcome it, to saying, I'll work with Congress. But if he set up an, a draft authorization tomorrow and said, I want this in a, in a month, mm -hmm. yeah. that, that would get the job done. And the question is going to be, if he doesn't make that move, whether Congress can do it on its and own. And Boehner has said, right, that he, he wants the president to draft it. Can, can I say, I completely agree with this. Yeah. It, this works so much better when the president sends up the draft authorization. That's it the way it's always so worked. so much better. Because if he doesn't, well, I would, you know, I don't need you, but I welcome you. Well, then you have six different authorizations put in. I put one in with, you know, basic authorization, some limitations, but there are five other ones floating around. And um, the better thing to do is for the president to send up a draft and then for us to have hearings and pepper the administration witnesses with questions and then refine it. That's what we did on the Syria authorization. They sent up one version and they got a different one. But th they started with a, a, a White House version. That is the best the way, way to go. It, it might also help if the leadership on a bipartisan basis asked the president to do this. That's I mean, true. This is a big deal. They asked the president, the president not to do it. That's yeah. true. <laughs> well, I think, the I think before the midterms, mm -hmm. they yeah. asked him not to do it. Yeah. Uh, we're now after the midterms. Mm -hmm. And he is doing what they asked. They wanted him to ask. Uh, I, I mm -hmm. was part of the pre-conversation on this. So they wanted him to ask. He's asked. Now they ought to ask him to send up a bill. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that bill will be prepared uh, uh, by a squad of outstanding lawyers like Jeff Smith and Jack Goldsmith and others, and it will come up for congressional consideration, possibly based on the six that have already been introduced, uh, certainly including yours. And, so and I, I would bet, I don't know this for a fact, but I would bet that as Senator Menendez is taking the Senate versions mm -hmm. into the Foreign Relations Committee, that he's talking to the, to the administration, hey, here are three versions, what do you think? You know, one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. I'm sure that they're trying to do a Frankenstein job and, and take the best from each well, and make it better. Let's not uh, spook it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but also, let's invite comments by Republicans. Let's Absolutely. not make this partisan in any way. Mm -hmm. So the war against ISIS, ISIL, is, is the biggest new war. There's still lots of troops on the ground in Afghanistan, but it's not the only one. You, you have drone strikes going on in, in, in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Somalia. We, we had military forces deployed around Nigeria just doing ISR, but when you had the missing girls, there are a lot of places where the U.S. is killing people right now. Um, Professor Goldsmith, this would deal with the ISIS issue. Do, do you need other authorizations for these other pin, you know, they're called pinpoint, but they're pretty expensive, yeah. extensive actions. I, well, the, the operations in Yemen and Somalia and in Pakistan and Afghanistan, um, those are all premised on the 2001 AUMF or some combination of that and the President's Article II powers. And yes, for all the reasons we've stated, both in terms of refreshing the authorities, having a public debate about whether we should be doing those things, and also, I believe, for putting some procedural requirements on the President to, so he can tell the American people exactly who are we at war with in all these places and where. It, it's, it's remarkable that I, I testified at the Senate Armed Services Committee last year on this issue. Mm -hmm. And it was remarkable how little the members of the Senate Armed Services Committee knew yeah. where we were fighting and against yeah. whom. Yeah. It was just a remarkable thing. Or have they visited those war zones? Let, let they don't even know where it's going on. Yeah. Let me add one thing. Well, first of all, on the ground in Syria, there's at least a, one more terror group called al-Nusra. So yeah. if, this is, if we're now authorizing war in yeah. Syria, there, uh, you can't just say ISIL is the, is the entire game, and there may, and there may well be others. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think people are looking for a strategy, mm. an overarching strategy, not just uh, let's uh, lift this group and th over here and some o group over there. How are we going to uh, I, I win? Maybe mm -hmm. a, a, an overstatement, but how are we? Well, how are we going to win the argument yeah. with some kid trying to decide whether to strap on a suicide vest in the boonies of Yemen? Yeah. How are we going to win that argument? Right. Uh, part of it's kinetic. Uh, but that's not all of it. No military commander thinks we can win kinetically. Right. We actually have to have a narrative here yeah. uh, about what we stand for and what we're trying to achieve that respects the interests of those on the ground 
uh, other than those in involved in terror groups and empowers them because otherwise uh, that argument won't be won to step up. So we need a strategy for that. And I think that strategy, uh, you know, with all respect, mm -hmm. ought to be part of the conversation with Congress mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and a conversation in which the American people participate. And, and the numbers indicate that we're losing that part of the battle because the flow of foreign fighters is, is right. keeping up. And, and, and there's an argument to say that the U.S.-led air campaign will actually increase that as a great recruiting tool, or, you know, et cetera. And, that's, and I do think the way Jane put it, it's, yeah. it's winning the conflict, but it's, it is also winning the argument. There is a bigger picture here that involves diplomacy and, and aid and, and, and the only way you're really going to win. Because I, I view, I mean, the Cold War was simple. There were two competing power theories. Well, now there's at least three. There's sort of the authoritarian model, there's the liberal democracy model, and there's the sec kind of sectarian jihad model that is a non-state model. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of competing... Uh, you know, philosophies of power that are out in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And it, it, we all have a huge stake in wanting the, uh, the small L liberal democratic um, argument to be the, the victor. And P.S., um, this war is being waged on social media. Yeah. Uh, the most modern communications techniques to take us back to the seventh century, go yeah. figure. Yeah. But we have to wage it back on social media. And they're, they're, they're damn good at it. I mean, you see they're, they're, they're videos, propaganda videos, very highly produced, and, and they know their audience well, and it clearly works because you're getting, you know, folks, whether, you know, possibly the shooter in Ottawa or this wax, this axe-wielding guy in New York and, or these kid, these teenage girls, right, in California, it worked, in Colorado, rather. One, one thing, and I want to get to audio qu uh, audience questions, but, Jane, you brought up something, you know, al-Nusra is another enemy there, but, but also, remember the old enemy in Syria is Assad. Uh, <laughs> we used to talk about his days are numbered. And Will an AUMF, perhaps I'd ask the senator, but I'm curious yeah. w what the others think, include, because this also gets to your point, what is the strategy? Is it just about them? Do, we, do you then pivot later to taking down the Assad regime? Do we deal with that issue now, or is that down the road? Um, well, I'll, I'll just say I don't think we'll deal with it, uh, because I don't, think, I don't think official policy of the U.S. any longer will be regime change mm. in a sovereign nation. I don't think that should be part of our official policy. Um, people say that they don't like that the president set a red line and didn't honor it. Mm -hmm. I think the president did exactly what he said he would do with respect to the red line on chemical weapons. If you use them, we're going to take action. We did. There was a diplomatic follow-on. The chemical weapon stockpile has been destroyed. I think the president did what he said he would do there, but what the president should not have said, I don't think we should be in the business of saying Assad must go or mm -hmm. others must go. We don't set the timetable for change in regime in other nations. We've been bad at it when we tried. And I think we should step back from the hubris and thinking we should set it. So I don't think Assad is a butcher. These crimes are horrible. The barrel bombing, the chemical weapons, they violated many international protocols. But we still don't set the timetable of a regime change for another nation. I think we should be out of the regime change business. And so I don't think a, a front on, we got to change Assad out, uh, should be part of this uh, authorization. I'd love to go to the audience now. Uh, and taking moderator privilege, if you'd like. Uh, go to the front row, Jeff Smith, first, if you want to quiz the audience. You need a mic. Uh, oh. Mic. Uh, wait, wait, wait. No, no. Nope. But for our, for our viewers at C-SPAN. Right, thank you. Uh, first of all, Jane, thank you for organizing this. It's just terrific. Uh, a lot of great ideas have surfaced in this. There are, it's an enormously complicated subject to get in a short period. Two very quick points. One is I think we do need to decide what the strategy is, uh, and that's unclear, and that's really the president's responsibility. Secondly, there's an additional audience here, and that is our enemies and our allies. That's true. Mm -hmm. And that's what true. we do in this legislation will be followed very closely. We will only win this war, written broadly against Islamic yeah. terrorism, with allies and with reform within the Islamic world. And if they know that this nation is not committed to a long-term commitment, uh, they're not going to participate. Mm -hmm. Our allies are going to say, you go ahead, we'll watch. Uh, and I think it's important that we signal to the world, as well as to our own people and to the men and women who fight it, that this is a long-term commitment of the United States. And we're in it. We're going to pay for it. Here. Here, here. Responses? Agreed. Absolutely. In the fourth row here. Uh, thank you for holding this thing. Question, how detailed should the congressional authorization be? Question. Should you just support going to war conflict, 
Or are you going to suggest things like tactical questions, no boots on the ground, uh, other conditions, use of certain kinds of weapons, et cetera? And secondly, what about a tax increase to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Great question for you, because yeah. your, your proposal has both a time limit yeah. and, and a prohibition on ground troops. Um, I, I drafted an authorization. I don't feel pride of ownership in the pieces. I put everything in for a reason, but subject to debate. But let me tell you what I did. My, my authorization basically tracks the President's four-point mission from the September 10 speech. The non-controversial, we're going to continue to be the biggest provider of humanitarian aid in the region. That's something we ought to feel good about. It is an important thing that we do. Point two, counterterrorism operations against ISIL leadership. There's some news over the weekend that may prove beneficial in that area. Point three, airstrike campaign in Iraq and Syria. Point four, uh, the arming and training and equipping of ground forces from the region, the Iraqi army, the Peshmerga in the Kurdish area, or vetted opposition in Syria. So I say let's do those four things, but I put four limitations in. A sunset. I put in a year as the sunset. Nothing magic about the year, but I do think there ought to be a report back and a and a reauthorization provision in the sunset. I put in a limitation on new gr no ground troops except in specified circumstances. I did that be for the reason that, that, uh, that was just mentioned. We, there's no amount of American ground troops that will win this war in Iraq and Syria right. if the ground forces from the region aren't willing to stand up against the extremism from the region. Let me ask and you if, they, if they are willing to stand up, then we should provide the support that an airstrike campaign, counterterrorism, arming, and we should provide that support. But if they're not willing to do it, I don't think there's a successful American ground mission in there. Um, and then just real quickly, the other two uh, uh, limitations I put in is repeal the Iraq O2 authorization mm -hmm. so that we don't have kind of dueling authorizations in the same real estate. And number four, narrowly describe who the target is because the use of the associated forces doctrine as part of the O1A OMF basically has evolved to we can take military action against any group connected with Al Qaeda mm -hmm. Um, or associated so long as they intend action against the U.S. or a coalition partner. There were 59 coalition partners. So let's try to be specific about who the target is. Those were the limitations I put in, but I think they're controversial. The sunset's controversial. The no ground troops is controversial. And the uh, definition of associated forces is controversial. We've got to get in a room and hammer those out. I, I do want to ask just in terms of definition because there's been a lot of parsing of words by this administration on things like what is a war. Remember initially it was yep. not a war. Uh, what is combat? <laughs> what are ground troops? You, you know that General Dempsey uh, has, has not taken off the table yep. uh, an option the President has, which is forward ground controllers. In your view, is a forward ground controller a ground troop? Well, it, I, I did put into my authorization some, you know, look, to the extent that you need ground <coughs> troops in to carry out the counterterrorism right. portion of the mission, fine. It's a to dangerous extent, job, though. To I mean, the extent that you need ground troops in because you've got to rescue American person, you've mm -hmm. got to do that. So there are some circumstances under which ground right. troops would be used, but overall, it, it General Dempsey, while he said, I'm not going to take off the table recommending ground troops, he also pretty made pretty clear in his testimony that we're not going to win this the w in the sense that Jane mentioned. We're not going to win this yeah. with American ground troops in needing to pick up what the region itself won't do to police the right. extremism that is within the region. But let's be clear about a couple of things. First of all, everybody who flies an airplane or a helicopter yes. or yeah. is in special forces wears combat boots. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Two of them. Mm -hmm. So how are we going <laughs> to count boots on the ground? Mm -hmm. Second of all, if one of these things crashes, there's going to be a rescue mu sure. mission, and absolutely. those people are going to wear combat boots. Yeah. So zero boots is not an option. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Uh, but the other part of that question was about pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're up to a billion. We're going higher. Uh, I was part of a, a, mm -hmm. a group of troublemakers uh, during my 100 years in Congress arguing <laughs> that we should uh, put our wars on budget. Uh, yes, there are emergency expenses, but they don't last for 13 years. And we're going to have to pay for this, and not just hopefully with the lives of the 0.1% who mm -hmm. actually sign up to serve, yep, and yep. God bless all of them, uh, but all of us are going to pay for this with tax dollars. And there has to be a debate about the cost of war, and we have to step up and, and mm -hmm. budget for it. Yeah. I, I just want to, just as a follow-up to that point, I want to ask you, Professor Goldsmith, is there a legal definition to a combat force? That, and the reason I ask that is because General Dempsey has taken out the large ground force, but, but he has kept open, in a number of instances, the, the idea of a forward ground controller, who, who's still in danger. The President's plan, announced on Friday, puts U.S. advisors outside of Baghdad and Erbil, mm -hmm. not just in two 
new operation centers in Anbar and north of Baghdad, but at several, they said several sites around the country, which are not front lines, but they're, they're a heck of a lot closer to combat, right? And, and the way combat is today in Iraq, that could be a, a suicide truck bomber driving in the front gate of a, of a brigade headquarters, right? So, so again, when I talk to administration officials every day, I feel like I'm being snowed on the definition of these things. Is there a legal definition? There's not a, there's not a well-specified legal definition of ground troops, and there are various types of troops on the ground there now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One way of getting at it might be um, to, instead of focusing on ground troops, to focus on hostilities. And you can mm -hmm. borrow language there, although it's fraught from the War Powers Resolution, and wh where hostilities in practice has been defined of, you're in hostilities if you're in a situation basically where the troops are in danger of being attacked or engaging in, 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 um, in a military operation. And so you might be able to get at this by a, not a definition not of troops on the ground, but, at, but rather what types of activities can they engage in. But there's no, there's no settled definition of that that I know of. But if you're flying a helicopter <laughs> or a plane, yeah. uh, you can get yes. hurt, killed, you can. You shot certainly at. Can. You certainly can. Mm -hmm. And it's a, and it's a, it's a to, put it, to put it mildly, it's a flexible test. Apache's flying over Anbar, and we know they have shoulder-fired missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, to the audience, maybe up here. I'm in Modellali with the Wilson Center. Uh, Mr. Kaid, you said that uh, regime change uh, should not be and will not be an official policy of the United States. But at the same time, you, are, you have this program of equipping and helping the uh, opposition. What are you helping them to do since their official line of pol policy is to change the regime? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Great question, and we and we got into that in a pretty significant way at the last Foreign Relations Committee meeting we had in September. The question is, could we provide arms to organizations that would fight ISIL that wouldn't also be focused on fighting the Assad regime? We're talking about Syria now, uh, obviously, and that's a, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. Um, the you know I think we want to make sure that the primary mission of folks that we're providing assistance to, once they're appropriately vetted, is the battle against ISIL. But, um, but we, I think it would be unrealistic to expect that they would suddenly decide that they're not focused on Bashar al-Assad. In my view, the Syrian part of this operation is, is as complicated as the Iraq side is. The Syrian part is extremely, is much more complicated. And I would actually suspect that if there is an authorization, if Congress enge embraces this authorization against ISIL, you will probably see this mission evolve. You know, when the U.S. went into World War II, we, did, we didn't just, uh, invade Germany. We went to North Africa, then we went to Sicily, then we went to Italy, then we came into France. You're going to see intense focus on Iraq and attempting to stabilize the situation in Iraq, and then attempt to stabilize the border between Iraq and Syria, and then attempt to stabilize the border between Syria and Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and Lebanon. And at some point, there will be an opening to figure out, you know, what is the right path forward uh, in Syria that can lead, hopefully, to an end of the civil war. But the Syrian side of this is much more complicated, and I acknowledge the question you raise. It's not e easy to separate out the motives. Don't forget Egypt. Indeed, yeah. indeed. New news. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Libya, yeah. right? They've, they've got a presence right. in Libya as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's go in the back, just for fairness. Thank you. Leandra Bernstein, Ria Melva Steve. I'd just like to ask a question about the precedent that's being set with either uh, executive overreach into the War Powers Authority or congressional abdication. Do you see this as a growing trend? And if so, what are the consequences? And would you, would you argue that the United States, either the President or Congress, is acting unlawfully? Yeah. 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 Um, and if, if the two of you could answer, uh, Mr. Goldsmith and Senator Kane. So um, in terms of the precedents, the president has been stretching the precedents in a number of ways. He's been stretching the precedents on using his own Article II authorities, not, as Senator Kane said, when he acts in self-defense of the United States, but when, he, but, but when he's engaged in pure humanitarian interventions in Iraq. Whatever you think of those, whether they're good or bad, moral or, or, or whatever, there's a serious question of their legality under prior precedents, and the president has pushed those precedents beyond where they've gone before. Um, he certainly stretched the 2001 AUMF beyond where it had been before to extend it to the Islamic State, very controversially. 
Um, and he has also stretched the precedent in terms of ma non compliance with the war powers resolution, not in this context as much as he did in Libya. So, uh, whether he's acting unlawfully, this is such a mushy area of law, and Article 2, especially it's until he's engaged in self defense, I wouldn't say that he's acting strictly unlawfully. I think he's acting deeply and prudently and not consistent with constitutional values or what he said uh, he wanted to do in the past. And it's worrisome for all the reasons Senator Kane said. I, I don't disagree fundamentally with what Jack said, except I would put more of the blame on Congress's shoulders than the White House. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I don't, I, just to be clear, yeah. excuse me for interrupting, yeah. I don't, I, I'm quite, I'm with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think the congressional abdication mm -hmm. right. mentality on this and on so many other issues is so massive right now that you, you know, I mean, think, think about this one. You have part of Congress suing the president. We don't want you to use executive mm -hmm. power, but Mr. President, whatever you do, do not bring to us any vote about a war before the midterm elections. The very people that are suing the president mm -hmm. over being too executive are telling him, but be an executive on this and we're not gonna challenge you. So I, th I view this as fundamentally the Article I branch not doing what it's supposed to do. And then on abdication, let me lay out what I think the real big picture problem is. Here is how war has now evolved in this country. You can start it without Congress. You can fund it on the credit card. Mm -hmm. Even in Vietnam, as unpopular as it was, we taxed ourselves to pay for at least part of it. Some of it was deficit funded. But now, Iraq and Afghanistan all on the credit card. Yeah. The decision makers' kids are not likely to serve. In the era of the draft, at least the decision makers' kids, if they were male, were likely to serve. And to the extent it's real controversial, but we have private contractors now that we can just contract to do things that we don't have to ask the military to do. Each of those moves, no vote, on the credit card, your kids don't have to serve, we can get contractors to do it together, com come together to suggest a grave danger mm -hmm. that we're sort of outsourcing yeah. the moral responsibility of sober decision making that the framers talked about when they set up the Constitution the way they did. But add to that, without a debate on a strategy, an overarching yeah. strategy for all this, I would say we're putting ourselves more at risk. You might even say an evolving strategy, right? We've heard different iterations mm -hmm. yeah. over time. Yeah. Um, here, just over on the side here. I'll come back. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Senator, it's Margaret Talib with Bloomberg. I wanted to ask you, um, the responsibilities more on Congress, okay, whatever. Let's say nothing happens for X period of months. At what point do you think, if you think this is both illegal and immoral right now, does the operation have to stop? Or is that completely unrealistic? And um, how do you see this interfacing with kind of, are Democrats gonna be obstructionist against the GOP Senate now? Does this come into play as a barter against immigration and other, mm -hmm. you know, whatever policies? Thanks. Uh, latter question, I, d I don't see that happening. I may be naive. I don't see it, you know, well, let's see, we can get an edge on an authorization by trading it off against an immigration vote. I, I do think, and I hope what Jane is encouraged that editorial pages and others are banging on us to, to act. But look, if Congress doesn't act, at some point there's, there are going to be those of us who are going to be introducing resolutions of disapproval or trying to get in the way uh, and stop uh, a war from going on. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Uh, because, because I do think, as, as Jack indicated, I do think this, is, this can be fixed. You know, the, the president, I think when he started on August 8th, he had a good faith defense argument under Article 2. But then it evolved to offense, but he had congressional leadership saying, but don't talk to us till after November 4th. Okay, now we're here. Um, we got to have this discussion. But if, if, if Congress does not do what it needs to do, I think Congress has to try to rein in the precedent from being the bad precedent of just unilateral presidential action. We've got to try to rein it in. L let me add one more thing we haven't mentioned, and that is sequestration. Yeah. Uh, Congress ducked the budget fight and instead imposed this straitjacket that nobody thought would actually happen, mm -hmm. but it's here, mm -hmm. uh, both on, on defense and uh, uh, non-defense spending. And there's no budget that's being debated for, for these expenses. They come out of a of a sort of general account called OCO, okay. mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to be hollowing out our military capability if it's surged in this direction. I, I'm not sure whether that's good or bad, but we're not talking, we're not debating it. What if something else happens in Ukraine, in Russia, in China? Uh, Ebola. Uh, I mean, look at all the other things that are popping up on the screen. How yeah. are we going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is just plain irresponsible. Yeah. Um, here. 
Thanks. <coughs> Tim Ratter from the German Marshall Fund. Um, I wanted to get back to the question of long-term strategy, not just against ISIL, but mm -hmm. terrorism in general. Yeah. And I worry about the language we use sometimes in calling it a war on terror. Mm -hmm. Obviously, ISIL is an actual war, but terrorism is sort of an ongoing conflict. It's a state of mind. There's so much psychology involved. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have senior officials saying that the drone strikes are basically a game of whack-a-mole, yeah. and they just keep coming. Because every time you fire a missile into a country, mm -hmm. people hate you, and then more keep joining. And you know it's hard to uh, discern cause and effect, but how much of the current terrorists joining who are part of ISIL had been incentivized to do that because of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? And I really appreciated the the Mr. Y article as a strategic narrative that yeah. the Wilson Center put yeah. out. Thank I was you. wondering if you could talk about that. And you know, what's our long-term strategy? What's our narrative? What's our yeah. effort to build, not just to destroy? If I could just say a couple of things. That's again what we need a public debate for. I don't think we're going to debate it in the next. Uh, Mm -hmm. minutes mm -hmm. here. Um, but the war on terror was a misnomer. Uh, and President Obama changed that uh, um, after he became president. He started to call it the war on Al-Qaeda. It's obviously mm -hmm. the war on more groups. Terror is a tactic. You're absolutely right. It is not a, 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 a defined enemy. Uh, and it's a tactic that's in uh, overuse at the moment. Uh, so, that, so that would be one point. On the drone strike issue, uh, you're right. To some extent, there has been what, what an Israeli strategist calls the, uh, the boomerang effect. The more drone strikes you do, the more enemies you build. However, um, those drone strikes, and I do know a lot about this. I still know a lot about this. I'm on a few advisory boards that are relevant to this, are, are highly targeted. And we have taken out some real bad guys with drones. I, I would argue they have to be part of our toolkit. But again, we have to explain the whole thing in a way that not just Americans, mm -hmm. Tim was exactly right about this, but our enemies and our friends out there can understand so that our intentions are clear and we're not building more enemies. It was actually Don Rumsfeld who wrote one of his famous snowflakes flakes, and he said, are we, are we taking out more than are rising up against us? It's a question mark and mm -hmm. it has to be debated. Mm -hmm. No question. I, don't, by the, I just don't think, I think we've been doing this for 13 years and I don't think we have a good answer for that question. And it may be that what we're doing now, I don't know, as bad as it seems the way you describe it, is the least bad option right. possible. A sobering <coughs> thought uh, in the middle here. Spread around a little. 10, 15 maybe? I'm going to take a few together, a few questions together. Oh, so, so we do? Sure, OK. I Can understand. We do that? Can we, and I have no, no, no means, uh, no means uh, intention to interrupt. Since we have 10 minutes to go, a little under 10 minutes, might, might do something of a speed round. If I could ask you to ask your question, there's a woman behind you as her hand raised, and, and we can do a couple at, at once. Okay. And the gentleman next to you. I'm Shun Murray from American University. Uh, there, there are two issues that you raised initially, Jack, Jack uh, Goldsmith raised initially, the, to have an uh, authorization for the ISIL, but also what to do with the 2001 AUMF. Um, I could imagine that there could be a targeted authorization for, the, for to go after ISIL. I wonder, though, it seems harder to, to do something with the 2001 AUMF. And I was wondering if uh, Jack Goldsmith could speak to the implications of allowing that to linger if it isn't dealt with, not only for the president's legacy, uh, but for the future, for the next president. Right. Uh, before we get to that, we'll just get a few, and then we'll kind of deal with them uh, one by one, if you don't mind. And Yes, good morning. Is my name is Veronica Cartier. Um, I um, quite agree with Senator Tim Kaine about this ISIS issue. Is a, there is a bigger picture philosophy of power. Uh, as originally I came from Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, there is a sensitivity of political culture in handling Muslim uh, issue. And I am very concerned of the bi bipartisan issue on ISIL. It jeopardizes our attention and focus on strategic thinking in handling the world politic against United States through radical Muslim movement. And that's what I think um, the Congress has to focus on instead of bipartisan issue. Um, so my question is that, um, is there any uh, discussion or 
investigative um, research who are the external um, actors on ISIS. Okay. Because the complexity, complexity, uh, complex, um, complexion of the issue of Muslim uh, political culture, I it is not only the local who are the actors, mm -hmm. the external actors it should be investigated and they are the one who, who is really harboring uh, and so the so second, my second if, if question. If I can ask, just because we, we have five minutes, but sure. is your question who's really behind ISIS and who, who's funding? The external, and yes. And external, and that, that's yeah. a fair question. I wonder if you could pass it to, just because we'll have a chance for one each before we, we, we uh, run up against our, our deadline here. And there's a gentleman in front of you. Yes, oh, okay, but I have been waiting to ask this question um, that, um, Well, in fairness, let's, let's do one each. So, well, let's do one each, and then if we have time, we'll come back. Uh, just really quickly, you mentioned sunsetting, or narrowing the 2001 AO map several times. Why not just sunset it uh, altogether? That's for Senator Kane. All right, so why don't we, uh, on the AO map, uh, you, you have the question, can you split uh, getting a new one for the current military operations from re reforming or repealing the 2001 uh, and then perhaps related to that question, this gentleman's question, which is, can you sunset it as well? And maybe that's a question for you, Professor. So, so, so briefly, I do think it's very important to update the 2001 AUMF, whether with the ISIL uh, authorization or separately. And the reason is for several. One, to put it on, to, for Congress to reaffirm who we're fighting against. And even if it has the same scope in practice, it's important that Congress do that, give it a contemporary legitimacy. Plus, and I think this is very important, I think Congress has to insist, especially since it's very difficult to capture all of the associated groups without a general phrase like associated groups, I think Congress has to insist that it be informed by the executive branch about exactly, and the American people should be informed, about yeah. who exactly we're at war against under this necessarily somewhat vague authorization because these, these groups don't, and individuals don't come prepackaged. And the combination of giving the public more information about who we're fighting against, plus a sunset clause, which Senator Kane has included in his authorization, which I fully support, those two things would do a lot to bring more rigor and discipline and accountability to that authorization. And, okay. I, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could not let the 01 AUMF sunset except as a pressure mechanism to get us to come up with version 2.0. Right. But there does need to be a version 2.0. If, if only to continue the uh, effort against al-Qaeda, because al-Qaeda continues to be a threat in many ways. But it does have to be defined in a way, now that mutating into other groups, how do we explain to the American yeah. public who it is? And what about of? some, some uh, assessment of cost and controls on cost? Because that is a big part of this, if this whole challenge expands. To Ms. Cartier's question, uh, perhaps I'll ask you this, Jane. The, uh, and the president has got to the, gotten to this to some in his strategy to say that we have to uh, get after the flow of foreign fighters and the fundings, the outside groups, et cetera. Yeah. Do you think there's a sufficient attention to the no. outside actors and causes? No, the flow of funds is a big yeah. deal mm -hmm. question. And of course, we've all read about at least allegations that some people in some countries in the region are sending mm -hmm. money yeah. in to fund ISIL and related groups. Mm -hmm. And that has to be fully understood. Who are those people? What are, where are those funds coming from? And it, you know, in addition to that, ISIL has captured oil resources and other things that have to be cut off. Uh, they're, they're the wealthiest terror movement in, in history, and, and they're different from the other ones because they're actually setting up a state inside of two. Uh, one is a failed state, that would be Syria, and one is a challenge state, that would be Iraq at the moment, but, but obviously aligning with others and threatening to make this bigger. So it's a big deal. Uh, your question is, is a valid question. But it's not just money, right? Because it's also the ideology, and, and these are not just you know, mysterious actors. There are state actors here who, who turn a blind eye to groups I that agree. allow this kind of stuff to... I agree. Right? And so and that's why we have to understand some it. Some began providing support to them mm -hmm. because they were the most effective against right. Bashar al-Assad, but now they realize the threat. They're like, okay, we're not going to support them anymore. So, so there was a, a lot of it stemmed from the desire to topple Assad, that they were getting support, and some of that support's now been pulled back, but there are still external sources mm -hmm. of funding beyond the extortion, beyond the oil revenue, beyond the, the bad right. knockoff jobs. That mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't forget the Sunni-Shia tensions. Yeah. A lot of it's that, too. Um, 
I, I believe, let's see, I believe we have time just for one more. So uh, maybe uh, you've been patient here in, in the second row. Thank you. I'm Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, I was wondering about the implications of a sunset provision in AMF. Uh, given the history of congressional inaction, it's entirely possible that the authorization could sunset. And if that happens, what happens? Do the troops come home immediately? Do they have to pull all the equipment? <laughs> yeah. It's just a new debate. Yeah. You want to take a crack at it? Um, I, actually th I actually think that we, we uh, um, it's possible what you say, that it won't be re reauthorized because of some political um, um, deadlock. But we it's worked remarkably well in the context of surveillance since 2007, 2008 when Congress basically updated U.S. surveillance authorities. They put a sunset on it, and it's worked remarkably well. It's been, a, it's been a forcing mechanism to make Congress come back. It's always been a little fraught, but it always happens, and I have every reason to think that will happen here, uh, simply because the stakes are so high, and there's general consensus that we need authorization to be fighting these groups. But, I, but if, it, if it did have somehow lapse, um, the main, the president can do a lot of what he's doing now in theory under Article Two. It's not a good idea, but he could, in self-defense, do a lot under Article Two. One consequence would be that uh, to, if the 2001 authorization ran out, then the argument for detaining people on Gitmo and other things like that would have to be rethought, and that that, that would be the main direct consequence, I think. Senator Kane, did you want to put? Yeah. No, I mean, okay. I, I think you've raised a fair question. I've, I've made my argument all about congressional abdication, and then I'm advocating that Congress do things. So your question to me is, well, what's the likelihood that Congress will do things when the abdication has been a historical trend? Um, but I do think forcing mechanisms are helpful, um, and there is a, 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 a precedent for use of sunsets that kind of drag Congress back in and Congress will act, and I think that would happen in this I, case. I, I think the bottom line, though, is the American people have to make this decision. Not a member of the Senate, not, not a you know, vaunted CNN correspondent, not even a grandmother over here. Uh, and the way that the American people speak is through Congress, and Congress has to debate these things. And I would argue has to vote on these things and stand up and, and be accountable. Let me just ask this closing thought, because I know we have to go, but it, it strikes me that this is a true moment of reckoning for the country, because we're talking about how the nation uh, decides to go to war, the, the, the most grave decision that both the President and Congress can make. You're deciding how the nation funds these wars, which is an issue that we've punted for the last 20 years, right, as you say, putting it on the credit card, but also about how the nation debates it, right, because, we, we, you know, we, we haven't, you know, in, in the lead-up to Iraq, you didn't have a proper public debate, et cetera. You're attempting it here now. With all the political dysfunction in Washington, um, is our government, is Congress up to it, up to that task, do you think? If we, after 13 years of war, have not learned enough to have this discussion seriously, then God help us. Right. Um, a Virginian died in the middle of September um, in, uh, in Afghanistan. We're still losing people in Afghanistan, Staff Sergeant uh, Strong from Suffolk, Virginia. Mm. He was on his fourth deployment. Jesus. He was on his well, fourth yeah. deployment. If we yeah. have not learned anything in 13 years of this, we should have at least learned that the the question of how we start military action needs to be dramatically improved. So yeah. I think we've learned enough that we will tackle this. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, um, of course, uh, this is a shameless self-promotion, but I'm proud that the Wilson Center can convene a discussion like this on the first day that Congress is back after this uh, election season from hell. And I'm very proud of Tim Kaine for, for coming here in his first hour back uh, to talk to us about this. And Bob Corker did it last year, and others have come. Uh, this conversation now needs to move a mile uh, up, up the hill. Senator Kane, Jane Harmon, Professor Goldsmith, Jeff Smith, uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Fantastic discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. That was fun. <laughs>